This is the Free Heal Life Podcast, episode number 108. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Heal Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. Happy Monday, Free Heal Lifers. And happy holidays to all. Whatever you're celebrating out there, psyched to be back for this week. And I hope that you have some winter wonderland telemarking plans coming up for later this week. And maybe even today. Hopefully you're skipping work or skipping school or doing something fun and uh, getting some turns in. So on the business side of the house, I wanted to get into some newsroom and notes before we get going today. Be sure to mark your calendars for Saturday, March 6th. This is the annual World Telemark Day celebration. We do this every year. It's the first Saturday in March, wherever you're at. I've done a whole podcast about this kind of explaining where this all came from, how it came to be, what exactly it is, but this is the day to plan to meet up with all your telemark friends at your local hill, backcountry spot, whatever, and go telemark skiing. So Saturday, March 6th, annual World Telemark Day celebration. A little closer from now, we've got January 15th at Pine Knob in Michigan, Free Hill Life Midwest is going to be teaming up with Motor City Telly for a Telemark Demo Day. So all you Midwesterners, Michiganders, I think is a, I think that's the term, <laughs> probably blowing it. Uh, if you live in Michigan, though, be sure to hook up with Motor City Telly and Keith Opperman, our certified Free Hill Life member out in the Midwest. They're going to have a little Telemark Demo Day there at Pine Knob. If you're a little further to the east in Vermont, be sure to mark your calendars for February 26th and Sunday, February 27th. This is going to be at Bromley, the 36th annual Corey Anderson Telemark Festival. And super excited to add that to the list of events that we're going to be talking about and reminding people about. I've got uh, the one of the organizers, Greg Paquin. I'm going to be talking to him on the podcast here in a few weeks, a little bit more about that and the history of that event. So be sure to mark your calendar, February 26, 27, 2022 at Bromley, Corey Anderson Telemark Festival. I probably should have done these in uh, order of date, but I kind of... Uh, did not do that in my notes. <laughs> so going back to a couple weeks from now, January 8th and 9th, Pennsylvania is going to be uh, uh, hosting the Seven Springs uh, Telepalooza. This is right outside the Pittsburgh area. And be sure to check that out. Uh, more information at telemarker.org for details. And then all the way week after uh, World Telemark Day, March 11, 12, Mad River Glens Free Heel Frolic. Be sure to scope that out. Always a stronghold in the Telemark community. And I always love talking about Mad River Glen. Ski it if you can. If you're out there and you have a Telemark event, meetup, whatever, let me know about it. Uh, email me podcast at freehealllife.com. I'd love to throw it in the newsroom and notes section uh, prior to the podcast. I think that's the least I can do because a lot of these are super DIY events. If not all of them, people are putting a lot of blood, sweat, and hopefully not blood and tears. I don't know. You know, you know what I'm saying? There's people are putting hard work into these things and I, I, all I can do is, uh, help out, get the word out. So Telemark event organizers, let me know. And uh, if you have questions about World Telemark Day, you can also hit me up, podcast at freehealllife.com. We're going to kind of get the wheels turning on that one and maybe even do a little refresher on how you can be the point person at your resort. Uh, other than that, not a whole lot going on other than it's snowing and uh, the base is getting a little bit better here in Utah. Uh, be sure to check website or social media for shop hours this week. The team's going to tweak it a little bit with, uh, the, the holiday coming up. 
want to be sure you're aware of that. So uh, you can always email them to customer service at freehealthlife.com. Tons of new stuff on there, fully stocked. Get after it. Winter's already flying by. All right, so that's enough on the business side of the house. Let's get to the fun stuff. My guest today is originally from Australia where he grew up on a large sheep farm. His father, who learned to ski in Europe pre-World War II, introduced him to skiing uh, when he was five years old at Mount Buller in Victoria, Australia. As a young man, he bought a one-way ticket to Europe in 1973 when he was 18 years old and started working in Verbier, Switzerland. In 1975, he ended up getting a gig helping haul film gear around for the famed ski movie maker Dick Barrymore, which introduced him to the hot dogging scene. He's competed at a high level of alpine skiing. On top of that, he's appeared in over 80 film productions as a professional skier, including several James Bond films. He's also a IFMGA certified mountain guide. And in 1978, he was introduced to Telemark skiing by way of the legendary Car Who team who was visiting the area. I don't want to give it all away in the intro. This was a rad conversation with a really unique individual and a Telemark legend, in my opinion. So please welcome to the podcast, John Faulkner. All right, John, welcome to the Free Heal Life podcast. How you doing? Very well, thanks. <laughs> I love it, man. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for making time. I know uh, you've got a busy schedule with guiding, and you're always off doing something fun. <laughs> I think the last time I hit you up, I was like, "Hey, can you get on and do the podcast?" You're like, "I'm going to Greece," or "I'm in Greece," and you sent me this amazing photo, and I was like, "Yeah, I would probably want to just do that right now too." So <laughs> uh, that's yeah. good. Were, were you spending some time doing? Uh, uh, I, we'll get into the guiding thing, but I, I was curious, like, are, were you, uh, did you do climbing guiding as well in, in the yeah, summer? Uh, yeah. I mean, essentially I'm a, a international mountain guide. They call it UIA GM mountain guide or in the States, I think they call it AMG, a something like that, Mary. Uh, but, um, uh, when you get that qualification, um, the little pin says that you can take people essentially anywhere in the mountains and do anything you want with them or anything they want from rock climbing, ice climbing, mountaineering of all forms. And then in the winter, uh, it's a license to adventure and backcountry and off piste and, uh, you know, depending where you are. Um, I've kind of run with the ball and uh, I saw that it said international on it. So, what I've tried to do is go to as many international places as I can, as I can with that, uh, with that and to take people to those places. That's amazing. I love that. Well, and, and you're, uh, you're back in your home base. Is, is Verbier your home base? Well, I, I, for, it's actually, you know, most of the, the stuff in Verbier and Clomba and all that is stuff. And it, it, it's kind of happened last century. Um, you know, and it's, it's so, there's quite a, a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. And I live in the valley in between Verbier and Italy. So I live about 20 minutes drive down the mountain from Verbier and up the road going towards Italy, over towards the Aosta Valley in a little, in a very small uh, mountain village. There's no bars, which is good. There's no shops, which is less convenient. Um, and uh but there's about 80 people living in the village and i absolutely love it there's no tourists uh hardly any well a few of the people ski a bit and stuff like that but they're just regular local people living around so you really feel centered amongst the the chaos of tourism that surrounds us oh that's awesome yeah I, I'm, I'm sure I, yeah all the things you mentioned i'm sure you come to appreciate after being there for so long you know like having a natural community that's just not a bunch of transient people on vacation and stuff that well that that for me has become really nice and you know you come back at the end of the day and and you know who your neighbors are and 
they're not going wild or anything like that. Every now and again, you'll have a glass of wine with them or something or, you know, but it's very, very relaxed. It doesn't have that urgency that uh, most people have uh, when they come on holidays. They've got to have a good time and they've got to pack as much in as possible. And I really, you know, I enjoy that. You know, I'm, 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 not, I'm not quite as young as I once was, so I don't need to party that hard. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know that that feeling of uh, I, I'm obviously a little behind on the age thing with you, but uh, 20 years of being around skiers, I can <laughs> me, me me and my liver can appreciate that sentiment. So uh, absolutely. Um, well, is it, for people that aren't familiar with you, I mean, they we just talked about where you live, but obviously people are probably picking up from your accent that you're not originally from there. So I was kind of curious, like um, maybe, maybe could you take us back to like where, where you grew up a little bit and just kind of some, some backstory on that. Okay. Um, I was born in Australia uh, in the, in the um, what we call, it wasn't really the outback, but it was on the edge of the outback. It was in a sort of semi-arid zone. And I was born on a, a very large sheep farm. Even by American standard, it was a pretty, pretty large farm. It was about 300,000 acres with 75,000 sheep. So there was quite a lot of sheep in there. And uh, we, uh, my family was one of the major producers of merino wool, which is what everybody likes to wear nowadays. Um and my father, before he passed away, was awfully pleased that I, I I had become involved with various clothing companies that were promoting wool because uh, during the sort of the, the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of synthetic materials that replaced that. And he was really, you know, in his, in his 80s, but so pleased to see that pe- people were coming back towards natural fibers. Wow. That's a lot so of sheep, that- my friend. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was it was good. So anyway, I came from the farm, and uh, and I, the first uh, sixteen years of my life, I, I lived on a farm, and seventeen years of my life, and um, then uh, when uh, when I turned eighteen, uh, I went up to the mountain, and uh, I'd, I'd been skiing since I was five years old. My father introduced me to the sport. And he'd actually been learned how to ski in Europe before the Second World War in 1937. And he thought that uh, he he was at school in England for a couple of years. And some of his friends invited him to go out skiing, as they used to call it in those days. And he went to the area around Lech and Zurs, St. Christoph, which was the the home of of Austrian skiing, where the the Schneider brothers had their... The, one of the first ski schools in the Alps. And so dad went there and and probably spent a couple of weeks. I don't know the exact amount of time he spent there. Absolutely fell in love with, with skiing, thought it was the best thing. And uh, then, of course, he went home to Australia. Then they had the Second World War, and that got in the way, and he was a pilot and flew and stuff. But after the war, uh, he came back to Australia, and a lot of the Europeans came into Australia and were went to the mountains because that's where their origins were from. So Dad was one of the first group of Australians uh, to go up and get into the skiing. And when I I was born in 1955, uh, which makes me 66 years old now, and um, uh, so when I was five years old, Dad said I was old enough to be taken skiing because. You know, otherwise you are just getting in the way of the partying and all of that sort of stuff that they <laughs> like to do as well. They're skiing, and uh, and also in those days you used to have to walk in, and they had they had mules and stuff like that bringing the the stuff up, and then they progressed to four wheel drive jeeps and stuff like that. And it was you know for kids smaller than that, it was just too difficult. So that that's where I started. I started skiing in a place called Mount Buller, uh, which is one of about five or six resorts in australia and uh when they have snow is a really great little mini resort it's uh compared to where i live now um it was great so my skiing passion was ignited and i i don't think dad realized that he was releasing the beast uh <laughs> or, you know at, at that time 
uh, and that it would end up being what I do. Um, he, you know, he was a farmer, so for him that was his his uh, two or three week holiday a year. And um, so essentially, I came from Australia, went to school, and then when my school finished, uh, I went up because I knew all of the people who ran the resort since I was five years old. It was very family. It was all, it, 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 you know, everybody knew each other, the people who ran the lefts and because it was such a small community in those days. So I got a job. Uh, I'd pull T-bars for an hour every day to get my lift ticket for the day. And uh, bear in mind, in those days, a lift ticket cost five bucks, mm. um, and which is a little bit, <laughs> a little bit different to a hundred plus or whatever it is now, you know, and we're depending where you go. Um, and then I, uh, I wash dishes in the evenings for, uh, for my lodging and my food and a little bit of spending money and went skiing every day. And that was the beginning of the, uh, well, the beginning of the end or the beginning <laughs> of the beginning. And, uh, while I was there, I met a Canadian guy whose dad used to run the ski resort of big white, uh, in Canada. And he'd been working there for a season. He said, hey, man, how'd you like to come to Europe with me at the end of the season? And I didn't have very much money or anything like that, but I'd, I'd saved up just enough for a one-way ticket to Europe, which cost about 300 bucks. And uh, it was a ship to Singapore and a jet to Athens. And then I took the train up to Europe and got a got a job once again at 18 years old. I knew how to wash dishes, but not much else. And um, and uh, so I got that, but it enabled me to start skiing. And so that was in 1973 in Verbier. Wow. And So Mount, and Mount, so, Mount, and Mount Buller yeah. to Verbier. <laughs> That's quite, yeah, yeah. quite the jump. At, at, that, at that time, uh, Verbier was way less than known. It wasn't a big international resort. Uh, of course, there were a few English, there were a few Swedes, uh, quite a lot of Belgians, but it was much more sort of earthy at that time. And uh, no, it was uh, it was it was great. You know, there was plenty of room for everybody. Uh, very few people knew how to ski powder. And in those days, pre-fat skis, it used to take you a lot longer to learn how to ski powder. Mm-hmm. No, it would take years. And you, know, you remember back to when before before we had skinny skis, uh, when we had skinny skis on telemarks, how many people could really ski in the powder. Yeah, It took them ages to get there. And leather boots and skinny skis. But at that time, I was alpine skier. So, uh, you know, I went there and I, my story evolved. I, I worked within the resort. And back in the day in 19, probably 74, 75, when uh, I ran into the guys who were filming for Dick Barrymore uh, oh, wow. on a film called Assignment K2, and I, ha- I I helped them carry the tripod. I, you know, I ran into these guys. I was young, enthusiastic, and they wanted some dumb kid to <laughs> to help them out. So I uh, I helped them by carrying the tripod, and I met uh, people like uh, Stanley Larson, who was on the, the original K2 team. Uh, Jim Stelling, Wayne Wong, all of these kind of legends uh, who were there. And they were such nice guys. And that exposed me to uh, what was called hot dogging or freestyle back in the day. And I thought that was the best. And they had the funny, in those days, short skis at about 180. My skis were 205s, 210s. So I started trying to do helicopters and somersaults and ski bumps like they were on their 180s. And uh, came to grief more often than not, but slowly learned how to do it and finally got a pair of skis that were a bit shorter that made it easier. And uh, my evolution, well, first, my first sort of evolution in skiing away from traditional skiing went, uh, it went towards the freestyle. And I ended up competing uh, over a period of time. Uh, I competed a little bit on the Europe Cup. I competed a little bit on the World Cup. I did a few competitions. Uh, I actually demonstrated on the European K2 demo team, doing somersaults, traveling around Europe. And uh, that that was a, it was such a great time because there were so few people who were involved in uh, skiing 
at, at sort of in the freestyle at that level that that really the doors were wide open and if you were enthusiastic and had a little bit of talent and had the willingness to go for it uh lots of opportunities presented themselves so, and so was that mostly so that was, was that mostly moguls or was it like aerial stuff uh, no I, I did everything i did moguls air and ballet because oh, in, ballet. The, in the in the competition uh they had they had um four categories they had moguls air ballet and combined so you could technically win money in four events four disciplines oh wow so you could have you know you might have come in 15th in the bumps and and 12th in the in the air and ninth in the ballet but your overall uh title you might have been fifth in the in the in the combined gotcha you know when you looked at it and so you had a chance of you know, you could you could win a little bit of money in 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 four events if you're good enough. You know, and you so and obviously there were some guys who were just amazing, um, who were always in the top five. So they were walking home with quite a lot of quite a lot of cash in their pockets. Hmm. And uh, so anyway, I you know I was into that, but during that time, I really realised that. More that I'm, I'm not particularly competitive by nature. I really enjoyed the energy of everybody and being around people. But what I enjoyed most of all was going skiing with people. And at the essence of it all, I realized that I'd rather be skiing than standing around on the side of the hill looking cool. <laughs> so I've never, ever really, I've never, ever really been that into the competitive aspect of it, although... I did enjoy it when I was doing it, but I just found there's too much time standing around and too many days lost in going from place to place mm -hmm. in order to compete. And the year that I did uh, the demonstrations traveling out around Europe was the year that I skied the less of any years that I'd ever skied because we were always driving some someplace else. And we actually had an artificial uh, ramp that we had and a big airbag. So we were doing shows in the in the middle of cities. Wow! And uh, you know, <laughs> leaping off this kind of and like a you know those slippery slides that the kids slide on. Yep. Put a little bit of kicker on. Put a little bit of a kicker on the end of that, and have a big airbag uh, underneath it, and you'd go down, chuck a somersault, or a, do an upright, or a whatever. Um, and uh, people had, you know, used to love it, and we got hired to go and do these shows everywhere. And uh, so that, that, you know, I went through my, well, let's say my freestyle phase and I, I made a lot of friends during that time on the, the competition circuit. Um, some of them were some of the stronger competitors and all the time I'd always come back to Verbier. And, in, uh, and, and when I was there, I was at a house with an open door and I'd invite people to come and stay and some of the guys I'd met on the competition circuit, they'd come they'd come by and and hang out in between content. And uh, and we'd all ski together and, and about that time in the mid seventies, I connected with Marco Shapiro, the uh, photographer, and we began working together doing doing photo shoots. And and was he so? so and because Mark Mark's uh, from the U.S. originally, right? No, Marco's Canadian. Oh, he's, he's Canadian. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, that makes sense. So and and that's yeah. like that's so you kind of went from the freestyle and then in in the mid seventies you're kind of connecting with Mark well, and that's where the first yeah. photos kind of yeah. started happening. Yeah, well, Mar Marco was also photographing the freestyle. Oh, okay. So he he was involved in. He followed the circuit when it wasn't too far away within Europe. So he he, did, he got a lot of the photos. Those you see still quite a lot of his old pictures when they sort of regurgitate them on the on the internet and stuff like that from mm. the, that era. Of Marco's pictures, and uh, at the same time, uh, you know Ace Cavalli. He uh, uh, he and I became fast friends he arrived from uh, colorado he's originally from minnesota and ace arrived in verbier and i don't know what year it was like 70 uh 77 maybe 78 he showed up 
and uh, and I was at scam one day, and there was this other guy scam. It was a foggy day, and after a while, we, we you know, we started riding up the tea bar together and smoking a joint and skiing more runs and and uh, and and that started a fast friendship. And we skied every day for about the next fifteen years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. Wow! And uh, and and you know he also liked to climb and mountaineer and and stuff like that. So uh, Ace and I. Uh, ended up becoming Marco's main skiers. Uh, and with my competition stuff, experience and my contacts with the industry and uh, myself, Ace, plus our friends, we had other friends who came in. There was you know, ladies who skied on the circuit who came in and skied with us, which was fantastic. And Marco suddenly had this little crew of people that he could shoot photos of, and we, um, we, we, we began getting contracts with different clothing companies because it was right about then that people started thinking, oh, well, let's use skiers to publicize our clothing. Hmm. And with our freestyle background, we could jump up and do a Daffy or do a Checker Demon or a whatever you know, it was or a somersault, and Mark would photograph the gear, and uh, the magazines loved it, the clothing companies loved it, and uh, suddenly we had ourselves our own little business. I was able to stop washing dishes and doing other jobs. And uh, I started getting little jobs doing just skiing. And, um, and uh, Marco got these contracts and he'd look after us because he wanted us to be available for him. So any, any, any money that came in, he'd, uh, he'd, uh, he'd divide that up amongst us. Wow. So it was great, and it was just all of this stuff just kind of happened. It was a, it was a very natural evolution. We didn't really push it; it just kept the advantage. The 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 opportunities just came uh, one after the other, and we were we were there and ready to do it. You know, one one of my friends talked about it. Oh, you're so lucky, and then I I changed that element around. I said, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So we were prepared to take the opportunity. So therefore, we were lucky. Yeah. Did you like? Did you like the? Uh, I, I've, I've, I'm curious because talking about the competition days, and and I, I get it. Like a lot of people are like, I always say, if you want to ski more, be be careful what business uh, in the ski business you get into. <laughs> you might be standing around a lot and not skiing a whole bunch. And I'm curious, yeah. like, what what was what was um, Shapiro's style of shooting? Was it real? just kind of flowy or was there a lot of standing around or you just, it, he was just kind of capturing stuff as you go. Cause I, you know, I definitely been on some photo shoots over the years where there's a lot of standing around. Well, we, we, we knew the mountain really well. So we knew that there was in one run that there was maybe, uh, uh, 10 different opportunities in one run to shoot. You start in the high alpine. There might be some cornices to jump off. There might be some powder shots with nice backgrounds. Uh, and and we'd work our way down. And we tried to keep the groups relatively small, maybe, you know, three skiers, four skiers. A lot of the time, just me and Ace. And in those days, it was less about the individual skier. We did a lot of group skiing. Mm. So we we get there, Mark. I'd look down into the valley floor and go, "Wow, look at that! That looks incredible." What did it? And, and it was very much teamwork. I'd just go, "Marco, what would happen if we skied over there?" He says, "Hang on, I'll just go and get in position." You know, it was before radios and everything like that, so it was very intuitive. He said, "You see that sun shadow line? Can you ski one of you in the shadow, one of you in the sun?" <laughs> no, and so and then we just go and, and we'd ski three four hundred meters and he'd be just standing there with a long lens bang 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 take a shot so we did a lot of skiing um there there was some uh days when it was required to do stuff where we'd hike back up because either the shot was so exceptional he wanted to get another shot at it or he forgot to put film in his camera or something stupid like that in the days <laughs> before digital um you know and he said oh can you go up there man it's so Awesome, you know, and we, and we were young and strong and stupid, so we, you know, we said, yeah, we'll do it. 
And uh, as a result, we got some fabulous stuff. Um, uh, but generally, it was about about the skiing and shooting what you discovered as you went. Yeah, that's beautiful. And yeah, and it was it was great, you know. And there was, I mean, there, there were definitely times when it was more work than than others. Yeah, if you know what I mean. I get, yeah, yeah. I guess at that point, though, <laughs> you've got the incentive of not having to head back to wash dishes at the end of the day. <laughs> you could, Absolutely, you can, yeah. Yeah, you can give and it a I little mean, bit of time. We were, you know, I mean, when you compare it with with film work, for example, which I, I did a lot of, you know, I worked on over the years, and I think I did something like 80, 80 plus films of different sorts. And, you know, you when you work on a film where, uh, like a major production where it takes uh, six weeks to do five minutes of film, yeah. when it's cut down, you know, and you're standing around and you're standing around, oh, there's a cloud, stop. Oh, there's, you know, this shadow, stop. No, go now. Uh, it, um, it, yeah. it, it changes a lot. And I um, I love doing the film work. I One of my friends from the, uh, from the freestyle uh, world circuit, uh, he was at the time the world champion, his name's John Eaves. And John uh, actually doubles uh, James Bond in a bunch of films. I was just going to ask he, you if you were in any of those. That's funny. Yeah, well, he and I had become good friends because we used to train in the summers together on these water ramps, and I went there to assist him. I mean, he was the world champion. I'd I'd be there and I'd help him because I spoke a few languages, and uh, I was sort of one of the assistant trainers. Um, and John got the he worked with Willie Bogner, and Bogner got the contract to shoot uh, um, to shoot the Bond films or some of the Bond films, and uh, I did one before that earlier on called the soldier which john also got where we uh filmed it with uh, george a dalbert who was another cinematographer and so we we did that and i was a bad guy and you know i died multiple times during the course <laughs> of the film and uh, john john of course was glorious and and uh you know got got away with everything um which was good and then when uh, after i'd done that it worked so well uh, that he said, listen, I've got the, you know, I'm looking for skiers for the Bond film, uh, which was A View to a Kill, the, the last film that Roger Moore did. Uh, and John doubled Bond, and he needed some Ru some Russian soldiers. So I got my uh, first taste of being a Russian soldier at that time. <laughs> and, um, That's amazing. And then, and then I ended up going on to do uh, to do another, I did the first film that I did, um, The Living Daylights as well, which was, uh, I think, uh, uh, Timothy Dalton, um, if I remember rightly, or Pierce Brosnan, one of the two. Um, but so, you know, I, I got, I got uh, a couple of the Bond films in, and then there was other films came up. You know, there was little bits with Warren Miller, and there was local film crews going on around. And, uh, as it went further down the road, I uh, ended up getting into doing you know more documentary style big mountain big mountain uh, skiing so that was uh yeah there were there was a lot of opportunities happening yeah well I, that's that's wild i'm glad i, I didn't know I, I i feel like i kind of knew you did some of that but that's yeah talk about uh preparedness meeting opportunity <laughs> that's a good good reason to stay prepared yeah luck luck is when preparation meets opportunity there you, i love that um so i before we get too far because i want to go back to is um w when you came in contact with telemark equipment and and kind of was this in the late 70s because you know, especially on this podcast, obviously we focus on telemark stuff and I'm always, you're one of those legendary guys I've wanted to kind of hear when that intersected with your, your ski experience, you know, and, and just cause a lot of that's not documented and I'm, I'm always kind of curious, like when, when and how it all came to be. Okay. Well, there was a precursor to that. <laughs> okay. When I was at school, when I was at school in Australia, I went to school. I was at a boarding school for a, for a, a year up near Mount Buller, which is my favorite place to ski. And they used to do ski touring stuff. Mm. And 
they actually had some telemark gear there, and I'd at that time had only alpine skied, and it was soft and terrible. It was like fish scales underneath were al- aluminium edges and uh, or aluminium, as you guys say, uh, <laughs> edges. And um, and uh, I uh, uh, I tried it then and kind of survived, but said, "Man, I'm never going to do that. You know, it doesn't work." You know, yeah. it was, I was, I was like 15, 16 years old or something like that. And, and compared to the Alpine gear, gear, which wasn't that advanced at that time either. Uh, I just had so much more control. So pass away the years and, and go on from there. And, um, uh, the Karu demonstration team, oh, no, no, uh, we'd seen, sorry, we'd seen a little bit of telemarketing and we're getting more and more interested in it. And because we lived in Klombam, uh, which was two kilometres above the resort, we wanted stuff to run up and down to uh, the town. And we saw that we could get we could get uh, some telemark gear, and it was a company called Track, T R A K, and they had fish scales on the bottom and aluminium edges, aluminium, and. Uh, and we we managed to wangle some pair, you know, I don't know how we got it, Mark or something talked his way into a pair. And we got we got a pair for Ace and a pair for me. And they were great as long as the snow was soft, but as soon as it got hard, the al- 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 aluminum edges wouldn't hold at all. Mm. And um, so we kind of did it occasionally at that time, and that would have probably been as early as 1978, something like that. And then... The following year, the uh, or, or the year or two later, um, the Karu demonstration team came through, and that was uh, Pat Morrow, um, Martin Williams, Brian. Oh, I can't remember who, who who the other guys were off the top of my head now, but all good guys, and they were travelling around Europe making a movie, and uh, Ace and I, they heard that we were there, and Ace and I. I said, right, we'll show you around. And they said, look, guys, we've got no money, but we can leave you a pair of skis each and some boots. And um, so they put us on those things, and we were pretty strong skiers at the time. And so uh, we had the old uh, leather lace-up solo uh, extremes. It was before the the buckle boot came in, Mm -hmm. uh, and a pair of Karu, what the mark was, it was kind of blue and... Uh, blue with the bear on the front of it and uh, so we uh, we got to they gave those to us and we we kind of paramark uh, survived did survival turns uh, around while they are there with them but had such a laugh and absolutely fell in love with it so that would have been yeah somewhere between 79 and 80 maybe 81 something like that and um and we'd already been telemarking for a couple of years, a little bit, but it was, you know, with with proper skis with metal edges, you could actually go places. Right. Whereas until that, we just used it as a vehicle for traveling, uh, you know, up and down to the house. And uh, so that was the beginning of our association. Uh, and and Pat, uh, the, then, of course, Marco started taking some pictures of us doing it once we uh, got our got our act a little bit together with it. <laughs> And he sent them in. To, sent them into Karu and to Azalon, and they loved the pictures that we did. And they started printing. They said, "Oh, we got some new skis coming out. We got some new boots coming out. Uh, do you do you want to try those out?" So we we tried those out and approved improved accordingly. And then uh, we got into contact uh, with uh, Nanny Tua, who made the Tua skis. Oh wow! Uh, okay. And and Tua. Tua actually at that time uh, began also making making the skis for um, for Black Diamond. I, I, was it called Black Diamond then? Yeah. It uh, was, uh, well, there was there was an early there was a middle ground where there was uh, the skis started saying Tua by Chouinard, and then yeah, and then there was a at probably like late eighties. Early yeah, 90s yeah, where it was, it was black but, diamond, but yeah, there's a couple. Yeah, different well, so we, we'd we'd already been skiing on tours, and they had those really cool um, sidewalls that weren't straight, that were kind of like uh, beveled, you know, in a uh-huh. sideways thing. 
I think it was called the Tour Cirque or something like that. Fantastic skis, absolutely great skis. And by that time, I had the uh, a solo uh, Extreme Pro, uh, which had uh, two buckles on it. Yep. It was lace up, and it went up a little bit, a little bit higher on the ankle, so you had a little bit more ankle support. And that made at, at that time it made a huge amount of difference. And uh, so we were skiing around, and we were starting to ski everywhere. We were skiing bumps, we were skiing couloirs, we were skiing everything. And we, we'd go, and a lot of the stuff we'd been skiing on our alpine skis, we were getting confident enough to go and, and do it. And uh, because and Marco started getting pissed off with us because he said, "Man, you guys only want to telemark now. You don't want to alpine ski anymore because that's where <laughs> that's where our bread and butter was." But so we 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 go we'd cross over back to the stuff whenever we had to earn some money because at that time telemarking was sort of you know you, you didn't really earn any money with it but we'd do it any time we were going anywhere for ourselves we'd just we'd just be telling and so I got it got the telemarking uh, took over as our passion uh, at that time and then uh, one year we didn't have a whole lot of snow and. Uh, we decided to do a trip to India to Kashmir, and uh, we 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 told a few people we were going to do it, and uh, suddenly people said, "Well, you know, what about making a film while you're over there?" And we made a little seven-minute film that you may have seen uh, called Kashmir. I think I, think I showed it. Yeah. I think I showed it once at the uh, at the trade fair in Salt Lake. I almost was wondering if you should because. I think the first time I met you was in uh, Valsanales at Schnaltstall, and I think you may have showed it there. Well, you know, I've I've been showing it on and off because it's kind of it's kind of become a little bit of a classic in, yeah. in a sense that it was true. You know, it was leather boots and skinny skis. You know, with a, with a true telemark attitude. And Ace at that time, he came back from the states and he'd somehow managed to get hold of a pair of the first Merrells with the plastic cups. The super comps. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <clears throat> you know, he suddenly, you know, I didn't get a pair of them, but um, he suddenly had those. And then I'd started tweaking my boots so I had a little bit more support, um, you know, just around the ankles. I had a little bit more lateral stability and stuff like that. I did a little couple of little add-ons in there just to make it work better for me. And we were, you know, We'd go anywhere, do it, and uh, ski anything on those things. And we we started skiing, you know, even sort of some of what you know, I don't I don't really like the word extreme, but you know, we 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 skied some quite steep lines of quite steep pe big peaks uh, in the Alps on that gear, and um, and it was it was uh, you know it, it was uh, it was a real evolution for us uh and and because we're into telemarketing we met a lot of the people uh at that time and we became involved uh with some of the companies um uh i went on an expedition with ace to russia and we needed some double boots and as at that time didn't make double boots so we approached we were put in touch with scarpa and scarpa had a boot called the logan i think it was and it was a double boot, double lace-up boot. Mm -hmm. And so we got these double lace-up boots, and they actually made a special inner for us uh, that was sort of more uh, maintained the heat more. And so we we, you know, did that. Did some great photos for them, and in, in, in a big mountain in Cantangri, we went there uh, we, and did a, a, an attempt, the first winter ascent of Cantangri, which is seven thousand meters. Uh, plus and got our asses totally kicked um, <laughs> you know got up to about 6,000 meters but it was just like it wasn't happening <clears throat> but we had the most amazing amazing adventure and um, came back with some fabulous photos and stuff like that and a, and a great experience under our belt and that was the time I guess it had to be uh, around about 89 ish and it was right around then that Scarpa was introducing that or doing testing their plastic boot. And uh, so they asked us to uh, become a little bit involved in the testing of the boot. 
Mm. And that was super exciting. Um, and there was a, a group of guys in America who were testing it out. Um, and then there was a group of Europeans who were testing it out. And um, we, we all got involved in that. We're very excited. The very first boots, I thought they were unskiable. Um, after it was the very first Terminator, and after skiing in, in leather boots, which were so soft and like having a pair of slippers on your feet, uh, you know, to get into this rigid boot, and it wasn't that it, it, it laterally there were, wasn't a problem. It was really nice, uh, but I couldn't even telemark on them first. They were so stiff. Yeah. I couldn't flex the boot. And so I ended up getting a hacksaw and a drill and started <laughs> slicing things out. And, uh, and, and I, took the, I took them back to um, Massimo, the guy who was the, uh, the development guy then. Yep. And, I, and he said, wow, you know, what, what's wrong with the boot? And I said, well, you can't bend them. And I showed him. I got a new pair on. And I put it. I said, look at this. And I said, you've got to be able to flex. You need to be able to flex at two points. Uh, you need to be able to flex at the ball of the foot and at your ankle and i said if you can't do that you can't telemark and he said yeah he said okay that makes sense and we talked about that and then i showed him my boots uh my leather boots and i showed him how the 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 if you look at the flexion point at the at the uh over over the ball of the foot that it wasn't straight across because the original scarpa boots were straight across the, the the bellows yeah they didn't front. didn't go to the articulated bellow for a little while it was like that straight yeah, across then, toe yeah so i showed i showed massimo that with the curve in my in my leather boots and i, I said and I'm, I'm not taking credit for that thing but i showed it to him and i think maybe some other people had also showed him but i said massimo you see how there's a curve in there would it be possible to do something like uh, like that on the on the telemark boot? And he said, "Well, the only problem is we've got to change the mold totally. We've got to build a new mold to do that." Mm. I said, "Well, it might it might be worthwhile considering that." And I think there may have been some other people who'd made similar comments uh, about that at that time. And so the next edition came out with the with the with the uh, curved bellows in it. Yeah. So that was. Uh, that was my involvement in the the uh, sort of origins of um, of the the plastic boots anyway, which I was really psyched to be involved with, and and we continued to test to test the boots for a long time um, over the years. I always went for the um, I never liked the really big beefy boots very much, mm -hmm. um, and. In North America, people tended to lean more towards the heavier boots, um, the you know the T1, the, the the bigger bigger beefy boots, and the Europeans, because I think they did less resort skiing and it did more touring and stuff, were always into the more eco the 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 T2s, if mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Yeah, like T2 eco T4s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exa exactly. So I was always pushing with that because I just. I just never, yeah, I, I still, in a part of my mind, I still like the feel of the leather feel. Mm -hmm. And I felt with the T2 Eco, I had something, and I always got a softer one. I got a softer tongue and everything like that so I could have something that flexed. Yeah. All I was after was, all I was, after was la lateral rigidity and a little bit supportive. I got in the back seat. Yeah. Coming from leather, you know, I, I really it's liked, tough. I yeah. Really, yeah, I really like to have a smooth, a smooth flex in the in the ankle and the uh, and the um, thing. And and in those days, you know, we were good enough that we could keep up with anybody and ahead of most. Uh, so that wasn't an issue. It's was only when fat skis came up uh, that that really the differences the uh, that you know more people began to reach a higher level in telemarking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? that definitely. Oh, that, 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 it. That's my observation and. Until fat skis came along, uh, there was a real big gap between the strong telemarkers and the sort of the uh, uh, let, let's say they weren't bad telemarkers. They were just you know people who didn't have so much experience. And when when the um, when the fat skis came out, it kind of it, it sort of lifted the level of everybody. 
Yeah, no, I can definitely see that. Well, and I'm, I'm so with all that background, like your boot testing, you're obviously you've kind of gotten to the film and photo stuff. Is it kind of during the eighties where you start sort of moving towards, um, this, this uh, becoming a mountain guide? Cause you know, I, and honestly, I remember, I think it, it might've even been meeting you one of the first times. I just remember hearing mountain guide in Europe. It was a lot more common at least when i first was traveling like 20 years ago i hear like oh that guy's a mountain guide and at first i just thought oh he must be like a guide in the area you know i didn't quite understand like yeah. the, the well, it, it, at, that, at that yeah at that time at this and it was uh i put it this way the difference was in in those days in the states it was before america uh entered into the uiagm the mm. uh, union of mountain guides and so there was a lot of experienced skiers and, and mountaineers who hired themselves out as guides, but they didn't technically at that time have to have a qualification that was recognized internationally. Um, and like everything, you know, they want to standardize and get everything. And there was some amazing guides, but there were some pretty dodgy ones as well. <laughs> and, and, and in, and in Europe, um, in Europe, because of the tradition, the mountain guide tradition started when they were climbing the first guys up Mont Blanc, the first guys up uh, the Matterhorn were all with local guides. Mm. And then over a period of time, uh, they decided that they needed to create some standards uh, to be to become guides, to be able to actually hire yourself out as a guide. So that was the... The, the you know in Italy they had a, ma- a mountain tradition in in France in Austria and the initial the initial countries involved were Italy France uh, Austria and Switzerland were the were the first places all along the Alps that created a mountain guiding community and then they joined together to make an international community mm. and, well- and and sl- yeah slowly that evolved and then they decided well if you want to be qualified as a mountain guide and have the full recognition you need to be qualified summer and winter right yeah because now there's like there's rock you know there yeah more recently i've learned like okay there's a rock guide there's a mountaineering there's ski you know yeah so in the in the states and canada uh new zealand uh sweden various other countries you can either be a rock guide or a summer guide and just have a qualification in that, or you can be a winter guide as well, which means that you can climb winter stuff or ski. And But if you don't have the summer qualification, you don't qualify to be an international mountain guide. Mm-hmm. You, you, you're recognized in, in your, within your qualification, but internationally you are not classed as a full mountain guide. That's only when you've got all of the. Uh, that's only when you've when you've jumped through all the hoops in summer and winter uh, disciplines. And and so when did you kind of start your track down? I mean, was that sort of an opportunity thing too, or was it something you like sat uh, yourself was, down and said, "I'm going this direction"? Uh, well, put it this way. I mean, I uh, uh, parallel with what I'd been doing in the in the 70s, I started doing my ski instructors exams as well. So I became a ski instructor and then I went on to be a ski, uh, an examiner for the ski instructors. Um, and then I did a, a telemark exam uh, sometimes in the 80s in New Zealand, uh, which I was really interested in. Um, but I, I was, you know, I was, a, I was one of the trainers for the Australian ski instructors at that time. And then uh, in... Uh, I started I, I, all during this time parallel to that. I began climbing. Uh, I was climbing for myself because eh? I used to like to climb as well. And we'd start climbing and skiing. So we, we were developing our skills uh, in the mountains. We're learning how to use ice axes, crampons, and, and move about in the mountains on all sorts of terrain. And so that, would, that happened over, a, let's say, a 10 to 15 year period. And I was so busy with the films and with Marco doing stuff, I didn't really have any time to sort of look at that as a, as a, to, as becoming a mountain guide. 
And um, in 1990, I had quite a bad accident with my knee. Uh, and, it, and it meant that I could no longer do... Be- the doctor said, look, you can't do... You shouldn't really jump because I'd been making my living from jumping out of helicopters and doing all sorts of weird stuff. And, um, you know, and, and I was in quite high demand as a stunt skier in those days. And then suddenly all that stopped. And uh, it was a bit of a shock to the system. Um, and the thing, I, one of the things I could still do, I could still rock climb, I could still do a lot of that stuff. Uh, and I slowly built myself up while I was in recovery, which took a couple of years because I had to have a second operation as it was quite critical. And then uh, what I could still do is I could technically still ski really well. You know, I can, but I just had to avoid jumping off big things. And so I started moving more into the background in the photos and stuff like that with Marco and doing more coordination work. And uh, I still skied for him, but, you know, he needed new people as well. So I started working more is a scent, you know, looking after the safety of everybody. And, that, and this is all before becoming a guide. Um, and and, and, and it, was, it was a slow evolution going towards becoming a mountain guide. And I didn't start to do my mountain guides exams till maybe 93, 94, something like that. Hmm. Yeah. And it, it's, a, I mean, I don't know what it was like back then, but I, I've, uh, you know, more recently met other mountain guides and I mean, it's a, it's a commitment, you know, I mean, I think, uh, it's, it's not, it's not just like, like you, you know, to become like a fully certified recognized mountain guide. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a big deal, you know, and there's not a lot of, well, there's not a lot it, of them out there. Yeah. It, it, it requires a lot of energy and a lot of effort and also a financial commitment, which is, uh, can be pretty stressful, especially if you've got a young family, which I did. Um, and it was, it was, you know, it was difficult because I was trying to juggle balls between earning enough money to keep the family going and, uh, and also trying to get my qualification. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so it took me quite a long time to jump through all the hoops. Um, and, uh, I ended up finishing, you know, doing my, my final mountain guides exams in, in, uh, New Zealand which is an amazing place to do your, your guides exams because uh, every, every time you go into the mountains, it's like a mini expedition. Mm. You know, you're going in and you're flying in in planes and you're taking food in and cooking and there's no guardians in the hut, nobody looking after you, and you're it essentially, and they get filthy weather and amazing mountains and amazing situations. So I did my, you know, I, I, I did it because uh, it was... It was hard for me uh, in Europe with not, I mean, I speak French really well, but a lot of the technological terms and stuff like that, I found it really, uh, really challenging to follow it and everything like that. So I changed over to the New Zealand system and it was a little bit smaller, less intense. It still took me a, a, a certain amount of time to do it. But I did my exams over about or six to eight years. Wow! And uh, you know, and, and you know, because what happens is, once you've got through the first part of your exams, you actually have to work as an apprentice mm. for a period of time, and you have to work with a fully certified guide, and uh, you got to clock clock up a number of hours working with clients as an assistant guide, in a sense of what what in Europe they call an aspirant guide. And so you had to, you had to clock up summer and winter uh, workloads uh, of a minimum number of days. And that, that, took, that took like two years to get the minimum number of days before you could go into the next set of exams. Wow. That's you wild. Know, so, and they're, they're, they're really strict with it. You know, they, they say, right, this is how it is. It's not like that in every system. They don't require that, but that was the New Zealand system. They required you to get um, – they, they really believe strongly in, in the apprenticeship concept of working with another guide who would be kind of supervising you. 
you know, as long as you weren't making any mistakes, but every now and again, they'd pull you in and say, listen, have a think about that. Is that the best way to do this or could you do it differently? You know, they didn't say you're wrong. They just say, could you do this differently? And that was super interesting. So I worked, I worked for a couple of, you know, a number of years as an aspirant in Europe, in New Zealand, in Canada, getting my, getting my wings, so to speak. And then I went back in and completed my exams, um, you know, later on. Wow. Well, and, and-, and then once I finally got through all that, uh, I mean, I'd already been, I'd already been taking people to places like Russia and various things like that before I was a guide because Russia didn't have a requirement that you had to be with a mountain guide. And um, one of my friends who was a mountain guide came along with me and he said, John, he said, you know, technically if something goes wrong on this trip, because I'm the senior qualified person here, I'll be responsible even though it's your trip. Oh, man. He said, it's about time. He said, it's about time you got your qualification. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, he, he, no, and he wasn't criticizing the way I was doing anything, but he just said, you've got, he said, you've, you've got it all there. You just got it. You need to, you need to get the piece of paper. And what, and what year was that that you did actually get uh, the certification? Oh, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't finish doing my guiding exam until I was like 49. What? I was I was old, I was the oldest young guide on the block. <laughs> oh. but in, a funny, in a funny way, I'd been guiding. I'd already been guiding uh, as a as an unofficial guide for quite a few years before that. You know, I'd been taking people to Russia. I'd been taking people to to India. I'd been doing all these different trips, uh, and you know, I, I was sort of organising that. And it was only, you know, by pressure, peer pressure from my guide friends that they said, come on, John, you know, get on the ball, do it. And it's a, it's one of the things that was, I'd say one of the hardest things I ever did to get that, one of the, the, the hardest I've ever worked for anything, and one of the most rewarding things that I've ever done when I finally got it. That's amazing. Well, and you've obviously been able to continue that in... I mean, let's see, that was, you said, you said you're what, 60, you're 66, you said? So you've been going, I mean, over like. Well, no, I mean, I've been, I've been guiding now as a fully qualified guide for 16 years. Yeah, right. You know, and, and, uh, you know, as I said, you know, I've taken people to, I've taken people to Greenland, I've taken people to Iceland, I've taken people to Russia, I've taken people to Japan taking people to the Himalayas uh, on various trips and all throughout Europe, um, you know, a little bit in the States, never really guided in, the, in, in, uh, in North America very much except in Canada. Um, but, you know, it's just been ongoing and, and magnificent, wonderful. That's great. Well, how, how do, um, I mean, I'm sure people, there's some people that are probably listening, like if they are, if someone's interested in hiring you, how do they, how do they get a hold of you? Um, I used to have, a, I used to have a website that I, but I finally sort of let that go. Um, either just contact me by Facebook, um, is, is a way to do it. Just John Faulkner. Um, you know, it comes up. It's got a guy jumping out of a helicopter or something on the page. <laughs> I'll put a link. Um, I'll put a link to it too. <laughs> yeah, so just, just send send me a message uh, and say, look, you know, we're interested in doing something. I mean, I'm still, you know, COVID is kind of, well, for want of a better word, kiboshed everything for the last two years. Yeah. Um, but gen on a on a generally, I do guiding trips uh, in in Europe and I'm just talking about the skiing stuff. Um, I, I do stuff in Japan. I do stuff in Iceland. I do stuff, uh, skiing and ski touring in Greece, uh, and then all throughout Europe and then other places as they come up of interest. Um, it depends, you know, some groups come in and say, Oh, we, you know, I had a group wanted to go to Greenland. So we organized that trip. Um, uh, in, I mean, I, it's kind of like, we'll go anywhere and attempt to ski anything, but 
I, if I can, I'd like to talk about the philosophy with with which I do things because, you know, I'm not I'm not thirty to forty years old and full of piss and vinegar. I'm sixty six <laughs> years old, um, and I've got a pretty mellow attitude towards the mountain. That that, that doesn't mean I don't ski uh, challenging things, but uh, I would say. I'm not looking for extreme. I don't even like the word. I'm looking for extremely interesting. Mm, I like that. And yeah, yeah, tell us about your philosophy. I want. I, I'd love to hear this. Is is just kind of how well, I mean, how the, you approach things? The thing things. is, is that you know, I mean, to use sort of American terminology, it's rad and gnarly, dude. You know all this sort of stuff. <laughs> uh, That's how know, we all I, sound I, over here. Well, no, a little bit, and I don't criticize it. You know, I've got so many of my good friends come from North America. Um, but as you get older and you, the more things that you've seen and skied and done, uh, you get a, I guess, perhaps a more global perspective. And I do my utmost to avoid places like Chamonix and Verbier and the big famous resorts. Um, my favorite locations to go to often don't even have lifts uh in japan for example the areas that i go in japan uh we might ride one or two lifts in the whole week mm. uh, and we're skiing over the head powder on a daily well, you know almost daily basis um in europe i have a recipe any resort with three lifts or less is what i like <laughs> that's my kind of place i like that well, because they're, they're the little, and it's like kind of going back into the 50s. And what, what I like, I, I like people, I, I, I don't like the concept of skiing en masse with people. Uh, I, li I like to have a group, of, a relatively small group of people to go skiing with. And you go to an area where there's not a whole lot of people. There might be some funky little restaurant you can stop at for lunch. Um, and, and it's rustic would be a nice way to describe it. Um, I, I, I don't like the big factory resorts anymore. I've been there and done it, or I've, I've been to a lot of those resorts before they were factory resorts and I haven't really enjoyed the evolution. Essentially the faster the lifts go, uh, I use an expression, you know, you've got a, a box, which is fixed size. The faster the lifts go, there's more flies in the box. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah. yeah, so you've got all of these people buzzing around inside the box, and you've got like a lift that puts 3,000 people an hour on top of a mountain. And in the old days, the lifts were so slow that you'd spend more time standing in the lift line and, and there'd be fewer people on the runs, which was actually a lot more relaxing when you did get to ski, but you had to have patience. And now my preference is actually for ski touring. So I tend to go to places where I might ride up one lift and then I only get a one-way ticket on, the, on the, the lift and then I start walking and I'll walk for an hour or two hours and then you might do a run with uh, 1,500, 2,000 meters all the way to the valley floor. And uh, and then uh, by the time you get back, if you have a little bit of lunch, it's almost four o'clock, so you may as well go to the pub and have a beer, and then you go and do it all over again the next day. You're not doing multiple runs, but the run you're doing is a is such a beautiful quality run. You almost don't want to spoil it by going into the resort yeah. and compromising on the quality that you had in the day. No, and I, and I I I. I feel like we share that sentiment i mean like i said i mean i'm younger than you but it's the evol the evolution of skiing in that sense in terms of the commercialization of it it's you know it's, i guess you could argue like it's really cool that more people are having the ability to go maybe i mean uh but yeah it's just it's there's a different feel and i like the funkier you know those are the places i seek out here if i'm going to go to a resort yeah. i, I want to go to that weird obscure place where yeah. you know people don't go and, and i'm not necessarily looking for like the vertical you know and people are always like where's yeah. your favorite place to ski and they're you know 
it's like I'm supposed to be like Alta Jackson Hole, you know, <laughs> like all these big crazy yeah. places. And honestly, I like the, you know, taking the two person lift up that's slow and hanging out with some yeah, interesting yeah, well, folks, just, you know. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, before when I was younger and before I was a guide and working with people, uh, what I realized is that a lot of people when they get away from their life, which is pretty frantic and full on, really appreciate it. You see, in the first couple of days, they're pretty wired. Then about the middle of the week, they really start to settle down and they see where they are and they take the time to stop and look around. And they really appreciate to do just a really beautiful quality run. Uh, and then when you when you get down to the bottom, it's kind of, well, you could go back and ski some more. Sometimes what I do is I just say, okay, guys, if you want to go and ski in the resort, I'll just see you tomorrow morning. You know, and it's because it's already, they got like an hour and a half of skiing left to go. And if they want to do that, that's fine. But my guiding job is essentially finished as soon as you get back in bounds again. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that, what they're hiring my, me for is to keep them safe when you're outside the boundaries in, in, uh, terrain that is not patrolled yeah yeah absolutely. and and and, and they, they 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 don't they don't need they don't need me to go and fang and ski the bumps or do whatever they want to do they don't need me to do that but you know i can hopefully guide them safely through terrain that could be a little bit dodgy uh and give them a great experience uh you know on a couple of runs and then i'll set them loose to go and they can if they've still got energy to burn, uh, they can they can burn it up doing a few runs in the resort. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, well, I guess I guess before we wrap up, I uh, before we hopped on, you were talking about kind of your next adventure. I'm just kind of curious, maybe uh, yeah, where you're headed. You kind of gave me a little snow report. Uh, I, I think you're. Yeah, well, we're, we're waiting for snow here too, so <laughs> I feel your pain. Yeah, yeah. I saw, I saw that. I've, I've been, I've been following, you know, what goes on over there as well to a certain extent. Well, at the moment in this part of the Alps, um, around Switzerland and Chamonix and stuff like that, uh, our little pocket, uh, let's say around Verbia, we've had almost no snow. They're only skiing on man-made snow at the moment. Um, there is supposed to be a considerable snowfall coming in this weekend. Uh, what actually comes, we will see in a couple of days' time. You could call me back and I'll tell you. <laughs> um, but they're, they're uh, because it's so particular where we live that uh, we kind of need a northwest flow in order to get quantities of snow. If it comes to the west, uh, Chamonix gets it. If it comes from the east or northeast, you know, over towards Austria, they get it. If it comes from the south, the Italians get it. But when we get northwest, we get we get the goods. And it can be fantastic, but we're yet to get the first fall yet. So um, we're waiting here. But in the east and uh, further to the south, they've actually had snow, uh, and they've had snow for like a month. And uh, I've got, despite all the COVID problems, which are creating a certain amount of logistical problems about people not being able to come into Switzerland and stuff like that. Um, I've got a crew, and we're at, we're going to go to Lavinia, where you've been, mm-hmm. and um, they have they've had snow since the beginning of November, and uh, I'm going to go over there and ski there around that area for 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 about two weeks. Oh, that's uh, with 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 a, with with a group of people, and these people have been with me to Kazakhstan, they've been with me to Japan, they've been with me to Iceland. Uh, they're they're good friends. And they, some of them didn't get to go skiing at all last year because of COVID. Uh, so they just really, really want to get it, get out and start sliding around. And uh, but it's kind of like a reunion of friends. And we might have a couple of other friends come in and join us uh, while we're there uh, during the course of the week. And um, and then. Uh, and then hopefully by that time there's some more snow comes back here for when I get home. Yeah, fingers crossed. I know I was thinking that today. It definitely is a little bit late start, but 
That's the way it is sometimes. Yeah. Well, so. it'd be great. It'd be great for all the businesses if if we have a snowfall before Christmas because yeah. that's that's the crucial time for you know for for all the business guys and everybody like that. Um, you know, if they if they get that that snowfall uh, that comes in any time in the first two weeks of December, uh, they're, then they're covered for Christmas because Christmas around about the twentieth. Of November, of December, it starts going berserk, uh, and then for two weeks until like the end of the first week of January, it's just craziness, and then uh, and then it settles down again, and that's when I, I quite honestly, I, I personally uh, don't really work very much over the the Christmas period, that Christmas to New Year, I just let it, let everybody go crazy. I might do, go and do a couple of ski tours for myself, but I just like to stay away from all the crowds. Yeah, and I take a little time out. You know, and as as I'm as I'm technically of retirement age now, you know, I guess I have the freedom of choice to do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, more power to you! I think that's a. Uh... You can use your your wisdom on the slopes to uh, know when to go and when not. <laughs> well, it's just that you know I really like to ski, but I just like to ski when there's not a whole lot of other people around there cramping my style. <laughs> oh, I love that man. Well, hey, I, I really really appreciate you taking the time to to hop on with me, and it's it was it's cool to get to know you a little bit better, and and you've lived a pretty legendary life. Uh, it's <laughs> even after having talked to you for for this episode, it's it's uh it's apparent you've you've uh, managed to to do some pretty awesome stuff i think uh it, it i hopefully it's inspiring to some young folks that are starting their little journey too you know and may yeah. uh may may look at luck a little bit differently so yeah well i think i think i think if you got a passion it's really good um but i think i think also that it's really important to slow down a little bit sometimes and look at where you are and, and look at the situations and, and, um, you know, don't be in too, in, in a hurry, do a lot of things, but don't be in a, in a rush about it. And then you, you take the time to appreciate the situations where you are and, and to learn because I see a lot of people, they come out from, you know, the cities and stuff like that. And they're so desperate to do stuff. They don't. They they they're carrying the stress from where they live and where they work into what they do in skiing, you know. And it's got to be at a million miles an hour. And for me, I think I've had a successful week if I can slow people down a bit. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a thing that most people don't have anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, I mean, we're all getting sucked into it all the time, you know. Yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, everything is going a million miles an hour around us. All right. Well, brother, thank you so much. Uh, good luck on your, on your trip and, uh, we'll pray for snow and, and I'm sure I'll have you on in the future to chat some more. Well, listen, um, if you get, if you get over this way, just so we're, we're always around here somewhere if we're not away. So just stay in touch. I will for sure, man. I can't wait. Yeah. Enjoy. Have a great winter. All right. Talk to you soon. Later. Okay. Ciao, ciao. That's a pretty amazing life. We just uh, <laughs> went over on that uh, conversation with John. Really appreciate him taking the time uh, to line that conversation up with me. And uh, what a privilege it was to kind of run through some of the stuff he's done in his life. And, you know, I think the biggest takeaway from from those types of conversations that I have is just uh, without being too cheesy is you know, follow, follow your passions in life. Um, and you know, good things will happen. And I'm not saying that if you follow your passions in life, you're going to make a ton of money, but I love, I love talking to people where you just look at sort of the ebbs and flows and you just happen to be in one place and something happens and it kind of takes you this other direction you might not have thought about. And also just, uh, you know, seeing what, uh, what, I, I guess it's the, the whole thing, you know, like, uh, when you, when you put effort into something, good things are going to come out of it. And to see how many movie productions he's done, he's been able to travel the world. 
and to see someone in in their late 40s actually certify as a, as a mountain guide i love that part of the story too um i think that you know uh age is just a number and there's there's plenty of time and as long as you you know stay safe and make good decisions you know there's there's a lot you can do in your life and i think uh he's uh, a great uh, john's a great example of this and uh, I, you know, I'm really inspired by his story and all the, the cool stuff that he's done. So I hope you enjoyed it as well, too. It's fun to connect with some of these folks that uh, have helped shape the way Telemark uh, looks now in, in uh, 2021, almost 2022. And uh, yeah, it's just wild to think of all the, the things that have happened during that time. So Thanks for listening. Uh, as always, we would love to be your preferred telemark shop. You can shop with us online at freehealllife.com. You can connect with the team uh, either by going to the shop or emailing customer service at freehealllife.com and they will get back to you. Uh, our other company, Telemark Skier Magazine, you can find telemarkskier.com for articles, gear reviews, and more. Craig Dossie's at the helm of that, another Telemark legend, and someone who's put a lot of time, energy, and know-how into the business of Telemark over the years. So check that out, telemarkskier.com, freehealllife.com. These are the things that help support the podcast. They help support everything else. And I would love to hear from you. Email me, podcast at freehealllife.com, and let me know what's going on in your neck of the woods Wherever you're at, let me know about events. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, I'm happy to promote those at no cost to you. Just let me know. And other than that, I think we're good to go. I'll be back next Monday with uh, the first uh, podcast of the new year. And it's going to be great. Uh, If you have some time and you're listening on Apple Podcasts, be sure to rate and review. And it always helps me know what you're thinking and helps uh, get the podcast out to more people so we can get more people in the know about what's going on in the telemark world so until next week enjoy the holidays hopefully there's some powder and some soft turns where you're at and of course spread telemark always